Welcome to Changing Higher Ed, a podcast dedicated to helping higher education leaders improve their institutions. With your host, Dr. Drum McNaughton, CEO of The Change Leader, a consultancy that helps higher ed leaders holistically transform their institutions. Learn more at changinghighered.com. And now, here's your host, Drum McNaughton. Thank you, David. Our guest today is Dr. Paul Alexander, president of Trinity Bible School. Paul has served as Trinity's president since 2012, and under his leadership, the college has seen tremendous growth. It's operating its new graduate school with two Masters of Arts program and launched multiple other programs. It wasn't always this way. When Paul joined Trinity, it was over $7 million in debt, was behind in its bills by over 90 days, and didn't know how much it owed, and making payroll in five days was seriously in doubt. In short, he was dealing with an undeclared bankruptcy and looking at shuttering the school. Trinity is now financially stable, it's improved its shared governance model of leadership, and has seen renewed health across all areas of the college. Paul, welcome to the program. Thank you. It is my pleasure to have you here. I heard you speak a couple of weeks ago at the Association for Biblical Higher Education. You have an incredible story to tell about how you brought Trinity Bible College back from the brink. You've been there 10 years now. What was the situation like when you took over? Well, thank you for having me. It's a great privilege to be able to talk and share. I'm I'm passionate about the whole area of uh, training and uh, especially theological and ministerial training. Uh, We found ourselves 10 years ago in quite remarkable ways uh, driving across the bleak northern plains of the United States. We had returned from leading a very dynamic institution in the United Kingdom. And when I say we, that's my wife, Carol, and myself. Uh, She has an earned PhD, and we have been partners together in this work for a long time. And we were asked if we would visit a small college that we knew a little bit by reputation, but not much else, called Trinity Bible College. And so we drove into the small town of Ellendale, just across the North Dakota border from the city of Aberdeen in South Dakota. It was very cold, (laughs) minus 19 degrees without the wind. Uh, When you speak to people from the upper Midwest, uh, they always tell you not even bother about the wind. You don't factor that in. It's just part of life. We came onto a campus that obviously had echoes of grandeur, but we sensed that it was not all right. And I won't go into all the detail, but one thing led to another. And within a fairly short period of time, Our story, our conviction, our sense of the leading of God after a lifetime of proving his goodness in our lives and the need of the college collided. And so, as you say, in 2012, in April of that year, I was elected the eighth president of Trinity Bible College, as it was then. It is now Trinity Bible College and Graduate School. And uh, we began service in the summer. 1st of July, officially. Uh, Interestingly, my first day in the office was not in the office, but it was with our accreditors, ABHE, because I had an inkling that not all was right. (laughs) I was, of course, completely correct. So let me just give you, if you're okay, just uh, the sort of bullets. Um, Please. First of all, we discovered that there was a... And I'm I'm going to ask the listeners to sit down if you're not at this point, because (laughs) this is, it's sobering. It is. It is. Uh, There were some things that were pretty obvious. There was the paper trail, although I'm not sure that uh, the professionals that were serving us, especially our auditors at the time, had been very helpful to our board. I don't think they had served our board well. Needless to say, they're no longer our auditors. Uh, But we very quickly discovered that there was a horrible debt burden for a relatively small school our debt burden was equivalent to at least one year's operating expenses. We were about $7 million in a hole. 
It was the worst kind of debt for two reasons. It had been accumulated predominantly through just trying to keep operations going. So there was no evidence for it. There was no traction from it. It was just literally keeping the lights on. It had ballooned to a place where we were very high risk. And so we were paying uh, something ridiculous like 7.2%. It was almost like having a credit card debt. And the monthly amount was scary in the extreme. I thought that was bad enough, but very rapidly, I was able to recruit a remarkable couple who came to serve with us. They had had a long association with our group of churches in the North Dakota region. He had a business background, but also a great church background. And so uh, the discovery began. And this is where perhaps even more so people listening to us need to sit down because we discovered that, first of all, our utilities were literally within 48 hours of being cut off. If that wasn't bad enough, I had a visit from the Farmers Union representative who informed me that there wasn't a single pint of propane left in a single tank on our campus. And in North Dakota, having propane in the tank is a fairly important factor in just surviving the winter months and that we could not order another delivery. When I asked him, how much do we owe you? He informed me it was about $62,000. It was like a left and right knockout blow. And then we discovered a huge pile of open invoices that had been stuffed in a box, not even entered onto our accounting system. And when we totaled those all up, it was about $715,000 of open invoices, bad debt. And then the discovery continued and we found that there had been a number of kind of payday good old boy loans with friends of the school uh, who had in total lent us about 750,000. But what was so troublesome was that there was no documentation. There was no paperwork. So we didn't know what the terms of repayment were. So when you added it all up, it was a horrendous amount of debt, a demoralized community, massive amounts of deferred maintenance, and a, a situation that really at the time, probably the wisest thing would have been to have walked in and turned off the lights and uh, quietly headed home. And in fact, the board had had those conversations, which we, we, we were not fully aware of, but slightly aware of. So that's what we discovered in the summer of 2012. So why wasn't the decision made to shutter the institution? I think as you hear my report, you might think that I am being um, clearly that there's a sort of an indictment against my predecessor. And I, I'm, I, I don't want that to be for a moment. I think the man was out of his depth. It was not his uh, sweet spot. He had not had experience, but he had at least the courage to try and keep the doors open. The board had wisely sought some counsel from a, a great educator by the name of Bob Cooley, who had been a former president of Gordon Conwell, and uh, he had given them some good advice. And I really don't know what the full answer is, that, except that I know two things. The first one was that God had, and, and this is not a pattern in our lives, but going back to the October of the year before, my wife had had a very dramatic dream. And she woke up early in the morning, tried to involve me in her dream. I wasn't interested. I asked her to go back to sleep. <laughs> By the noon of that day, she had become quite desperate to articulate this experience that she felt was so clearly uh, a, a dealing of God. It was something of God. We, it was unfamiliar territory. We were not prone to making big life decisions based on dreams, but uh, she felt that God say, that's your next appointment. And uh, the dream was kind of in two parts. The second part, we were sitting in a car in her dream. And there was a sense of urgency. We had to get out of the situation that we were in. She was saying, let's go. And then as she said it, she turned behind. And to her horror, she saw a baby that appeared to be dead on the back seat. And in her dream, we both began to weep. And she was saying, it's dead. It's dead. And with a motherly instinct, she reached back, picked up this baby, and it stirred in her arms. And she began to nurture the baby. And we, we, we both had this sort of ecstatic reaction. It's alive. It's alive. And we woke up. 
uh, or she woke up and um, wasn't sure what that was, except that by the noon of that day, she felt that God had said to her, this is your next assignment. Now you need to fast forward a few months and we find ourselves returning from the UK. We'd had a home here for many years. We knew somehow that our next assignment was going to be in the US. We saw the rapid secularization of the nation. It troubled us. It stirred us. It gave us a sense, a desire that we wanted to be part of a solution. And here we were and the board were wrestling. What do we do? Where do we go? Somehow they had delayed the important decision. Um, I don't know if anybody could tell you exactly why, except there was a, a, a sense that maybe there was some help. And when we got into a small group with the executive committee that had been from our side unplanned, obviously from their side, they had traveled in to meet with us, chair of the board, who to this day is still the chair of the board, he's got some wonderful longevity, a South Dakotan given to hunting and you know classically sort of outdoorsman. And these were his words, Drum, he said, 18 months ago, we seriously, in fact, it was a little less than 18 months, board meeting 12 months previously, we had seriously considered closing our beloved school. He said, we asked ourselves, had the baby died? And that was kind of familiar language to us. Carol hadn't shared her dream with anybody. And then the most poignant moment was he looked back, he said, but we felt that if someone were to pick it up and nurture it, it still had life in it. And although I hope our faces didn't give anything away, I think in our heart of hearts, we knew this is it. We're, we're committed. We can't get out of this. And so for this unknown reason, the school had kept ticking along. My predecessor had at least managed to keep the doors open, even though it was a tenuous uh, situation. And our lives were at a place where we knew that we were very open to the leading of God. And so we committed. We said, if you would want us, we will come. We didn't know, to be honest. And I don't even know. This is where the whole fiduciary struggle arises. And maybe some takeaways at the end I'll refer to. But uh, I don't think even the board knew the horrendous situation the school was in. But here we were. It was another day. And... I never felt particularly overwhelmed. I, I know I felt responsible, but uh, I just thought we've got to get through a day at a time. And we did. And perhaps I'll get the opportunity to tell you some of the outcomes. Oh, well, most definitely. Uh, yeah. I'm fascinated. I'm fascinated by what you did. You know, the whole story of being guided to this is is incredible. Uh, whether, you, whether you believe in religion, whether you don't believe in it, you know, you've got to be able to trust your intuition to take you in the right direction. And you and Carol clearly did that. And when everyone can come together like that, you have a shared vision. Now, the devil is in the details, as the saying goes. You know, T.J. Rogers in his book, No Excuse Management, he says, organizations don't fail for a lack of vision. They, sh they fail for the routine blocking and tackling, the execution that needs to happen. So you came on board, you didn't really have a full picture. Nobody really had the full picture. I would imagine your first month was figuring out where we are and what we need to do. So take us through those, those first you know, three months, if you would, of the steps that you took. Well, as you say, there is that level of, of persuasion, whether it's intuition or whether it's a God sense. All that I know is that uh, after a lifetime of serving God on four continents, I can say with the deepest of conviction that there are times where you know because you know because you know that uh, mm -hmm. there's something beyond yourself in it. And so we had that deep spiritual persuasion. And I was wonderfully, wonderfully helped by two key appointments that I was able to make. Both people with, I think, similar deep convictions. The first was a young man who had done a master's degree under us many years before. He had led a very creative church in Cape Town. 
under amazing circumstances, he and his family arrived in the U.S., and we reconnected. There was no connection in us all coming to the U.S., but we reconnected when he was pastoring kind of a broken church in Virginia. And I called him one day just out of concern. I said, Ian, uh, how are you going? Uh, you know, he was a, in some ways, he was a, <laughs> a spiritual disciple of mine. And uh, as I was about to say goodbye, I felt again the same impulse. And I said, by the way, um, you wouldn't be interested in a job, would you? <laughs> and uh, that had come in my first assessment where I realized that nobody was left. I had no cabinet left in place. There had been a dean of students who had put his hand on his heart and promised me a year of his service. And three weeks later, he was gone. Uh, and so things couldn't get worse. And uh, within a matter of hours, my friend said, we're very interested. And they packed up their family and a cat in a van. And within a month, they were in Ellendale and were here before we were. The other one was an outstanding couple, the Tituses. So we just put our heads together. I think there was a twofold issue. The first was just the community itself. It was damaged. It was broken. Uh, we'd become highly dependent upon a somewhat dysfunctional football team to keep the student numbers up. So we had 60 rowdy students, very few of whom would have met even the most basic entrance requirements under normal circumstances. They were a liability to us. It was difficult spiritually just to kind of harness them. Our faculty were disjointed. And I remember one of the board was showing me around and I said, uh, where do the faculty get together? And the answer was telling because he said, they don't. Well, that says a whole lot. I said, you don't even have a water cooler? No, we don't even have a water cooler on campus to meet. And there was a terrible broken down building that had been built by the state of North Dakota around the turn of the century. I'm sitting in that building now. It is the most beautiful, beautiful renovated building, but it was in horrible condition. It had been left to freeze. The uh, basement had literally broken in on itself and this four story building had tilted back about six to eight inches on its back foundation. We eventually brought in massive hydraulic equipment. We jacked the whole thing up. We put in new big girders, and a, a different story. But we had one room that had been a student lounge. And I persuaded this board member to find some people to help us paint it. We painted it out. I went down to our one and only furniture store in town. I said, hey, what do you say that if you could put together every single piece of soft furnishing, lounge furnishing, that's been on your floor for three years or longer and sell it at cost. They were delighted. So they shipped out all the stuff. Remarkably, it all fitted. Uh, you know, I mean, there was no, there was no <laughs> interior decoration thought, but it, it worked. Some of it we still have. And we would carry coffee pots across in the snow and the ice. And I pretty much made it mandatory that everybody would meet in the commons for coffee, no agenda, just meet from 10 to 10.30 every day. We still do that. And if I had you on my campus now, I'd walk into that room, I would fight back the emotion as I feel almost now, and I'd say this room healed our community. So that was a very big part of the first steps that we took. And the community began to gain courage to believe for another day. We then started to look at the administrative side of it and the financial side. And we made two big decisions. The first one was that we would pay local vendors as quickly as we could, as much as we could, even if it was a token payment. That was appreciated. So we were able to kick the can down the road a little bit on some of those invoices. The second one was I felt uh, just out of sheer honor and integrity that we needed to acknowledge those that had made short-term loans to us. I, I went to Winston Titus, our administrator. I said, this is the person that sent us this money and it's the longest outstanding. I said, I know we can't afford it, but I need $5,000. We owed him 50. And uh, through blood, sweat and tears, Winston cut me a check. I wrote a letter and these were my exact words. I said, dear friends, enclosed is my earnest. And I want you to know that we will make every commitment to repay you in full. Thank you for your patience. Forgive us for not responding earlier. 
I sent it off, but my heart sank a little bit. I, it, it just felt a little bit light on. Well, about 10 days later, I get an envelope and in the top left-hand corner is this. They're, they're a, a, a ranching and oil family and uh, their name was there. And I have to say my heart sank. I thought, this is not good news. It's come back really quickly. And so I was trembling. I went back to my office. I tore open the envelope. And my check, our check dropped out. I thought, oh no, he's sending it back. And uh, I thought he was going to tell me not to offend him like this. And, and with trembling hands, I opened it. He said, I was just waiting for some token from you. I'm returning your check. We will not be cashing it. And we want you to know that all of the debt is now canceled. Wow. And it broke something. It broke something in the heavenlies that I can't describe. By the end of that first year, through making those two strategic commitments, we had paid off every dime in our short-term loans, in our, in our open invoices. We had cleared every bit, and we had cleared that 750000 A little bit of that was when we were able to refinance, which made our structured long-term debt a little bit worse, but not much. It was not the full amount, but we were rid of that horrible, ominous storm cloud of short-term debt. A Christian mortgage company on the East Coast took a chance on us, but again, it was at, I think, 6.8% this time, uh, still a crippling debt, but we committed to not missing a single payday. What I omitted to say was at about the same time, we had lost our regional accreditation with HLC. That's a story all on its own. I've done some investigation, and uh, who knows, they might listen in if so, so be it. But I think they were very unfair to us. They did not deal with us fairly. And in fact, I've, I've had people say that they were looking for some soft targets at the time to, to try and make an example of how schools should operate. Well, our national accreditor, ABHE, obviously had no option but to take severe action. And we were placed under the severest form of probation which of course is a, a double whammy. Not only are you placed under probation, but it's public censure. So you have to place that on your website. So you're a, you're a parent wanting to send your child off to college and you check the college website and right there in bold print under probation, you can imagine. It was just like a perfect storm, but we set to and healing the community relationally and being honorable with the worst of our debt in the short term. And I think that we started to command the favor of God. It wasn't easy. Uh, it was a, a long, slow journey, but we kept the doors open. We recruited another student body. We had reasonably good retention and uh, we continued to move. And then by the second year, we were able to start to bring some innovation in our programming and the process of restoration and healing began in earnest. Well, it's a fabulous story. And what I'm hearing is key hires, you know, bringing people on for the team who had the same kind of vision that you did. It was dealing with the finances through faith, through people's good graces, and through restructuring debt. It was also rehealing the community, you know, the faculty and the other areas of the community. So those are really critical things to do, but there's also the communications piece in there, the crafting the narrative and how you talk about this with your various contingencies. I know, knowing you as I do, I know that was very critical for your turning this situation around. Absolutely. So uh, what I've described is really just emergency management and we wouldn't have sustained it without a God story, without the sense that there was a future. Uh, this was a great, noble institution that had been around for nearly 70 years at the time. But then I realized that as president, perhaps my, my number one task, once we were emerging from the emergency, was to craft the narrative. There wasn't a whole lot to tell. It was quite difficult, but certainly the most important one was that the lights are on, the doors are open, we've got hope, we've got a passion uh, to, to train and educate. So we reworked mission statements and vision, all that sort of fundamental work. But then I took that upon myself. And 
I chose every door and any door. I was un, uh, there was no pride at all. If there was a, a, a ladies meeting up the road with seven ladies and they were pre prepared to listen to me, I felt I could start seven conversations. I felt that was important. I went to a minister's gathering and somebody really got in my face and told me that the college had closed. I said, no, it hasn't. It hasn't closed. It's closed, he said. I said, sir, it hasn't closed. Eventually, I had to sort of reposition myself right in front of him. I said, look here, I'm the president. I'm the president. It's not closed. And then <laughs> I built on that. And I think that audacity, that willingness, that deep, deep conviction that we had a job to do and it was worth doing. And, and in the greater scenario, the greater issues that were at stake were the need to communicate that we we de desperately need a ministerial workforce that understands our cultural milieu. Uh, we've got these tidal waves back then that sort of all, all happened now, but these tidal waves of secularization crashing in from the East Coast and the West Coast. And we found an aging ministerial workforce o over time, just a, a story that needed a counter narrative that we don't have to throw in the towel, that the kingdom of God's a good news message, that we have got a relevant message for even the culture shift that has occurred in our day. And so I wove those together. I was well equipped. My wife had completed some years before a really seminal piece of work in her PhD, where she looked at the shift in culture, the moral ambiguities and especially the changing authority structures of our contemporary cultural environment and how had Christian leaders responded. A big piece of empirical work showed Christian leaders generally hadn't responded very well. And so I was able to take the best of that narrative, a, a good sort of Leslie Newbigin story, if you like, about <laughs> who in our age is going to stand and who's going to proclaim that we have a message of hope and um, I, I then added to that my deep conviction that for 3,000 years, going back to the age of Pluto and Aristotle, we have not found better ways to equip people to do good jobs than in the academy. And I had a deep persuasion about that in theological education. I said to a lot of people, let me tell you that if we trained doctors with the same mentality and the same commitment of resources as what we train ministers, I would never want to be sick in my life again. <laughs> well, who uh, does anyway, but... <laughs> well, who, you don't want to be sick anyway, but if you are sick, you, you kind of want to know that the guy who's got the stethoscope to your chest has at least had a reasonable education and maybe cut up a cadaver or two over the years. Yeah, you, you, don't want, you don't want him saying when he puts the stethoscope up to your chest, oh, is this what a heart sounds like? <laughs> Precisely. And, uh, and I felt that we had totally relegated the quality and essence and passion and importance of especially Christian higher education. Uh, we had put it on the altar of convenience. We had dumbed down. In my group of churches, I can tell you right now that in the emerging workforce, uh, and this is anecdotal, but I, I'm prepared to defend it, the most widely asked question that is asked of us in Christian leadership is, what's the least I need to do to get a license to preach? And my response is, God help us. If that, you know, no wonder, no wonder people get bored in church. We've got too many boring preachers. And so all of these juices kind of flowed into my heart. Of course, I speak with an accent, and so I suppose at least people give me the benefit of the doubt for the first 30 seconds. And so I crafted this narrative. We need rigorous ministerial training. We need to train a generation of business leaders. We need outstanding Christian school teachers. Who wouldn't want a school teacher who has worked out the key issues of their life by sitting in a stimulating chapel four days of every week of their study? And I crafted that into a narrative and I found every platform I possibly could to announce it. And remarkably, it didn't take long before we got attention. Mm -hmm. And with this narrative, you use this to build alliances. 
you've built multiple alliances, you had some strategic events that you've talked about in the past. Tell us a little bit about that, if you would, please. Well, of course, the first, I've already mentioned to you, our staff and faculty, we needed to heal the community. Then I realized that we needed a functioning board. And unfortunately, institutions like ours often get populated over time by, if not deliberately, certainly by default, a kind of an ex officio group of people. So somebody pastors a large church, hey, get them on side, maybe they'll, they'll help a little bit. And somebody's got a denominational leadership role, or somebody's you know, and, and so you get this collection of people and uh, that often leads to quite weak governance and weak governance is central to every single story of institutional failure, almost without exception. I, I could not agree more. And so I felt that I needed to really build strong alliance within the board. And so uh, I did a few things very deliberately. I did a seminar once on fiduciary responsibility, and you could literally see the blood draining out of these people's faces as I talked to them. And, uh, and my punchline at the end was, whether on my watch or anybody else's, don't you ever dare allow to happen what's happened previously here. And they took that seriously. And to their credit, they rallied to us. I asked them to put their money where their mouth was. And so there were a few things that we just couldn't do, like a staff and faculty retreat at the beginning of the year or vision day, as I called it. I said, well, you just finance it. And so to this day, the board knows that there's a certain time in our meeting where little slips of paper are going to be passed around. And what are you going to do to help me to do my job better? And uh, that's been wonderful. And then I try to identify our constituency. Who is our key constituency? In our group of churches, and I'm sure in most denominational settings, we're unique. We're not denominationally owned or operated. We're a standalone college, but we have a strong denominational association. And so obviously the moment you start that there's politics, there are other schools, there are other regions, but um, I just, again, I, I, I went to meetings. I took out a lot of people for coffee. I shared my heart and my passion. That was helpful. We started to re-engage. And then there were two constituencies. The first one was our alumni who were disillusioned, discouraged, unhappy, and it took a long time. Um, we eventually were able to add a bit of staff to the alumni office. We started a weekly email uh, that to this day has something like a 35% plus open rate, which is a very high open rate for an email. It goes out to about 6,000. We've only had a handful of people saying, please take me off your mailing list. We started to really make that interesting. We put pictures in. We made far less text, bigger font. That was, that was key. I could almost give a seminar on just that. And right now, I'll go around the country. People say, we can't wait for Wednesday to get your weekly email. And then I started to ask everybody across the community to write it. So we've got a schedule 12 months in advance. The email goes out from the person writing it, whether it's our athletic director, director of development, uh, VP of academics, grad school, and they tell stories that we try to coincide with strategic times through the year. Obviously, enrollment's a big deal now, so we get some of our coaches writing bit by bit. And then we were blessed by our 70th anniversary. We put on a show. We, 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 we got people who had sung in song groups before to come back and form a, a group that that was enough of an incentive. And we got, uh, we got about 700 alumni back on the campus, uh, which was for our situation and our remoteness, quite amazing. We're gearing up for our 75th and that's going to be a great event. And then I began to look at people who had some level of association with us or who we could get connected to, who were either affluent or influential or both. Normally, affluence and influence go together. We created what we called the President's Council. I got a small group of those that had stuck with us through thick and thin. One of our board members has been on our board for 50 years, in fact, 52 now. We started to gather this group. I, I invited a significant, in fact, the first time we did it, we invited David and Barbara Green from Hobby Lobby. And they very graciously flew in in the corporate jet. That was a good way to attract 
a reasonable group. And we said, we want this group to counsel and advise the president. It's the president's counsel, no fiduciary responsibility. And uh, that's been a huge blessing to our school and continues to this day. So these kind of key groups that we identified, we, we levered every potential relationship we could. And God gave us some wonderful early breakthroughs with some major donations, some great campus development, and then eventually a massive commitment on behalf of one family to reduce our debt. And uh, last year, July, we burnt our mortgage and we paid off every last bit of the debt. So some of these things really were craft the narrative, build alliances. I would I stick by those. Absolutely. So fast forwarding to now, no debt. You've got a decent size endowment. It's not Harvard size. It's growing. But it's, it, it's growing. What's next? Well, here's an interesting thing is that whenever we get uh, some major donations now, we did a little calculation about 85% of all the donations given to us now are unrestricted. And the message I get from that is our donors trust us and we've had to really build. So, so what's next? Uh, in 2014, we started graduate studies. Our graduate program has exploded, it's exponential. We now have five master's degrees. We have a very cutting edge PhD. It's the delight of my life. And we've got very key leaders who have chosen. It's a European style research degree that we offer. I have just written a book uh, that I've just called Faithful, subheading stories of faith, courage, and resilience. Pretty big words for us as a school. We're not gonna sell that book. Uh, I'm gonna go on a bit of a tour back to our key constituency. My goal is that people will take the book and give a donation to our endowment. My goal is that it'll raise at least a million dollars for our endowment fund. We are loving the current reports every week of our student recruitment. Uh, we're, we're back way ahead of our pre-COVID numbers now. So that's very exciting. So what's next for, for Carol and me? We're not over yet. We're not done yet. We, we feel very energized. I have coined the phrase to all of our constituents that we want to build a resilient, not just a sustainable, but a resilient institution, nimble, responsive. And so we are now trying to take out of this wonderful momentum that we have and some of the very initial, somewhat goal-oriented strategic planning. We're trying to texture that into the next five years. We think that we have got some very significant um, offerings in terms of our training initiatives. Some of it's very, very creative. Uh, it's hurt a few heads along the way getting there, <laughs> but uh, we have a wonderfully united team. We have an engaged board. We've diversified the board. So if I were to look at the building blocks, I would say uh, I'm right now a very happy man very grateful for God's faithfulness, incredibly grateful to some of the kindest people I've met anywhere in the world. Love our student body. We retired our football program. That's a story all on its own. No regrets whatsoever. We have students that are entirely compatible with our vision statement now. And we would like to think that we will do some trailblazing in terms of a courageous model for another generation of training people for ministry and the workplace. So uh, we coined the phrase compatible disciplines. We are not a liberal arts school. We are unapologetically Bible college, but we do do a great job in training school teachers, especially for rural communities. We have an entrepreneurial program in a business department that is incredibly innovative and helps our students. We have actually taken the step to add a soccer men's soccer program. So athletics is not athletics, not an issue for us. It's just the right mix. And uh, I can put my hand on my heart and say, thank you, Lord. We love the journey. I love Christian higher education. I think there's a huge future for us. And uh, we want to try and set a high bar so that others can be encouraged along the way. Well, thank you, Paul. This has been, this has been wonderful. It's been great having you on the show. Three takeaways for your fellow presidents and boards. 
Well, first of all, build coalitions, make sure that relationships are preeminent. Uh, pretty much everything that happens in life happens out of relationships. I would say, secondly, make sure that you craft the narrative and know how to share it and that others come along with you to share it. Do people know the mission statement that is driving you? And then I would say, uh, unhesitatingly to boards, find out what fiduciary means. <laughs> Actually get the etymology and the definition right. And even if it scares the pants off you to get started, make sure that you hold yourselves as a board accountable to those primary fiduciary. It's not just that you pay the bills and you get through another year. It's that you are fulfilling the primary goal. You will have the confidence of your donors who do that. So build alliances, craft the narrative, and get the fundamentals right with integrity. And that's a board issue, and the board should take responsibility. And being a governance consultant myself, I want to say thank you for those words. <laughs> well, I believe in them completely, and I saw the glazed look in our board's eyes when I try to help them understand that they're good people. But um, but it had just faith faith based institutions can often make fundamental mistakes when it comes to governance. Uh, we, we, we find willing, willing people. And before you know it, and I hope this doesn't sound rude, but our boards are overweight, middle-aged, white, male clergy. And that constituency doesn't make the best a group. We, we need some of that representation, but uh, broaden the base, get diversity, get buy-in and... Uh, I did a PhD in theological education. I've got shelves of almost every seminal work that's ever been written on theological education. And there are very few that you don't get to maybe the third page and the issue of governance arises. And so it's, it's, it's incredibly important. Yeah. I'm a, a board leadership fellow with the National Association of Corporate Directors. And we have a saying around there, one of the big problems of boards is they're pale, they're male, and they're stale. <laughs> well, that I, I said it perhaps a little bit more rudely than that, but it's true. <laughs> I wouldn't say so. Paul, I want to thank you for being a guest. This has been a wonderful conversation and wish you guys the best of luck up there at Trinity. Well, thank you. Give me some feedback from your audience. Uh, you're doing us a great service. Appreciate you. Love your heart and spirit and uh, keep going, doing what you're doing. Thanks for the privilege today. Thank you, brother. You take care. Thanks for listening today. And a special thanks to Paul Alexander, president of Trinity Bible College, and for his sharing his story about how he and the Trinity team brought the college back from the brink. Our next guest is Dr. Ashley Finley, vice president of research and senior advisor to the president for the Association of American Colleges and Universities. Ashley will be joining us to discuss AACNU's recently published study on the same page, Administrator and Faculty Views on What Shapes College Learning and Student Success, and its implication on higher education curriculum and what institutions need to do to ensure a college education is more relevant and meaningful to employers and its graduates. Changing Higher Ed is a production of The Change Leader, a consultancy committed to transforming higher ed institutions. Find more information about this topic along with show notes on this episode at changinghighered.com. If you've enjoyed this podcast, please subscribe to the show. And we would also value your honest rating and review. Email any questions, comments, or recommendations for topics or guests to podcast at changinghighered.com. Changing Higher Ed is produced and hosted by Dr. Drum McNaughton, post-production by David L. White.